we're so punctual, isn't that nice? It's not 715, it's exactly 7. I would really like to welcome all of you here tonight to Bethany Lutheran College and the Able Soccer Fine Arts Center, especially on such a terrible, cold evening. I was feeling sorry for Brad and Ann, but I, I shouldn't be, because you're all here. You came. And so I'm sure you will um, enjoy their show. Brad had a show here at Bethany 23 years ago, and I've seen both Brad and Ann's work at regional shows, and I've talked to them over the years, and I thought it was most appropriate to have them do a show together here at Bethany. Husband and wife, artists, um, looking at their artist statement, they both went to Augustana in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And they both went to Northern Illinois and DeKalb. I thought, wow, that's a coincidence. And they're married. And they're still married. And they're still married. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure there's more to that story. And, and their work is very compelling, but it's also intimate and personal. And it requires slow looking and a close up looking. And I think. That will come through in their artist talk too. So please welcome Brad and Ann and Witness. Hello. I want to thank um, Bill Bukowski and Bethany College and Susan Harstead for um, the invitation for us to exhibit our wares. Um, and what we do, not necessarily economically, but from the heart and soul of each of us, vocationally. Um, we've been practicing artists for much of our married life. We met as two young art makers back in the 17th century. No. Um, <laughs> um, you know, at art majors at Augustana College. Um, we were both recipients of the senior art prizes in our respective senior years. We were married a couple years later, and a lot of people said, um, maybe gave us the prediction of maybe lasting, a marriage lasting amongst two artists. Um, you know, strong spirits, maybe two years. Well, we just celebrated our 35th anniversary this last summer. So, anyway. But, but we've not fallen off in the sense of our commitment to visual expression, being artists, designers, visual thinkers, and image makers. Um, I would say visual poets, um, in the sense of just what poetry brings to cultures, um, and what expresses of the human spirit. Um, what I'm going to be doing, um, we and we're both going to be talking. I'm going to tell you folks my spiel, my take, my experiences, and then I'll hand it over to my wife. And um, I'm mainly going to express a little bit about my background and why I make art. Why do I do images? Um, what got me into it in the first place? And why I still do it? Because economically, it's not very, you know, um, common sense in the sense or practical in many ways. But uh, there's something deeper than just economic survival. Um, in terms of the richness of what human life we have and what is given to us every day. Um, basically, I grew up in the, uh, the plains of South Dakota, Sioux Falls and Aberdeen, South Dakota, in rural and small urban settings. Um, very much growing up being very much at odds and being spooked by and then falling in love with the incredible flat landscapes of this part of the country. Um, not necessarily needing Grand Canyon vistas for inspiration or mountains or oceans, but the sea of grass and plains and farms and things like that. Um, I grew up with uh, being parented by two incredible parents, my mother and father, who were dynamically very strong voices, opposite corners politically, but lovingly as parents to my brother and sister and myself. Um, I will say in terms of influences to me as an artist, um, come from both of them in odd ways. Um, my mother, Grew up in the cities, uh, was very much a part of the arts culture there with her parents and things like that. And I grew up um, in an area which you could say is maybe not rich in the arts, but in some ways it, it's extremely rich in terms of Sioux Falls and certain parts of South Dakota. I was taken to concerts, given opportunities to see shows, um, theater, and all over the place um, in the cities, in Chicago, in Sioux Falls, by my mom. She led everybody, my dad included, and just took us to things and places. And we you know, we had no, question, you know, no questions asked from as, from as far back as I can remember. Um, and I remember just being 
blown away by some you know, incredible symphonic concerts, as well as a retrospective of Rembrandt's work at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts back in 69. Um, and I'll never forget just being blown away, even though I had a really miserable cold and sore throat, and as a 10-year-old at that time, you know, I wanted to get home, get the heck out of there, but somehow seeing Rembrandt's paintings and etchings at that time, age nine, left an indelible mark in my soul um, in terms of how someone can see some magical, infinite, beautiful things, um, divine things in ordinary human experience, let alone depressed human experience. Um, my dad, not experienced in the arts in his background, mainly rural, farming, mechanical, machinery, it, um, in terms of just practical, doing it yourself, building things with one's hands. And that was my experience with him, was learning how to use one's hands, become familiar with tools, um, and not be afraid of them. And just the practical element in seeing the beauty in simple, practical things being made, such as furniture, wood elements, um, machinery, um, in terms of just how things work, from electricity, engineering things, to um, mechanical things, and just you know, building elements around the house. Um, and yet, Dad, for his lack of arts experience, loved being introduced to new things and was a strong proponent along with my mother in terms of getting all my sister, brother, and I involved in lessons in the arts, mainly musical instruction. Um, and I would say that has been my passageway into being a visual artist, is through being a musician and being exposed to musical, the musical arts at a very young age. Um, being somewhat of an accomplished pianist when I was in high school and into college, and then being playing professionally and avocationally the trombone. Um, being a trombonist in numerous different groups through my college years. And I would say that was a key thing in terms of just exposing me to the beauty of an art form, the musical arts, the total arts, and expressing not just um, you know, usual entertainment things, but incredible um, sensory things of the human imagination, the human soul, human yearnings, um, just the tonal language of chords, harmony. Um, what can be said and expressed about this life that we live without the use of words, without the verbal narrative, um, without explaining it in tight definitions? Um, and that, in being involved in some incredible um, ensemble experiences, traveling Europe with a, br with a brass band, playing some incredible um, cathedrals of Europe, um, seeing incredible art museums at that time was my first exposure to seeing the original likes of fantastic works of many artists, impressionist, ancient to contemporary, in the museums of Paris, London, Hamburg, Munich, you name it. Um, early instruction in the visual arts kind of came mainly in college from a handful of mentors and instructors that both Ann and I had, which um, was phenomenal. Um, we were encouraged in all, we had great instruction in all different disciplines, from physics to the religion to theology to the philosophy and the arts um, to math and calculus. At, at, at Augustana. But we had incredible teachers that made time for us, made time for the students individually outside the classroom. And um, mainly in the sense of teaching art seriously, where it's a serious communicative form uh, in communicating the human experience in its fullest breadth. And we'll never forget that in terms of just learning how to handle artistic media, um, how to put it on the same high priority level as anything practical, vocationally related, but perhaps even more so being maybe the core of who we are as human beings. Um, and then seeing the different ways that, you know, different artistic media can express um, elements of our human psyche, um, our human experience, our relationship between people, and why we need everybody, why we need human communities. Um, Basically, how art can transform the world by transforming people and transforming how we see things. Mainly seeing things from multiple different points of view, not just a usual narrative way that we are given constantly by you know, other outside sources, advertising, media, but in, you know, embracing the nonverbal aspects of living and learning. Um, that led to further graduate studies that um, I pursued years later after Augustana at NIU, Northern Illinois University, which is near the great artistic cultures of Chicago, seeing more museums and great works of art in prints, graphics, and painting. In terms of my background, that's the core thing. Um, and then after NIU, we moved back here to Minnesota in, in the mid-90s, um, both of us having extended degrees, myself having a terminal degree and MFA in, in graphic arts and prints. 
But moving back home to Minnesota, in a sense, um, which was a part of my childhood and making several trips to the Twin Cities with my parents to see grandparents and been seeing the culture and the arts of the Twin Cities. So it's kind of a coming back home, um, mainly geared by moving towards and becoming back with family. But, um, and that's when we had our first son, our only child, Jonas, and we became parents. But we never let up on the artistic practice. Um, to hit the core of things, why do I make artwork? Why do we do this? When for all practical purposes, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't, you know, move it along and up the economic ladder. In many ways, it's an economical risk-taking venture, um, which can leave you down and out, can be of an incredible surprise, but there has always been, for me, the need to express. And this is key, things that um, I've always envisioned or have always remembered from my earliest childhood years, but could not verbally explain. But the need to express the intangible, the unexplainable things that are part of human experience, that are part of how we see and feel, hear, and um, reflect on things that may be impossible to explain verbally or in verbal de definitions. With exception, with um, maybe the language of poetry comes very close. Um, and I found with the, uh, the language of art and design, color, shape, line, value, color, and their composite definition in expressing the space um, that relates to the, that is from the real world that we live in. It's a way of expressing our human experience and how we interact with that space. It's a way of also expressing the idea of question in unexplained things versus definitive answers or expected outcomes. More of life as we have um, lived together, you know, have had several jobs in the name of supporting an artistic habit. It's more of an issue, life is like loose ends, things not being tied up tidily or in nice complete packages. But at times that does happen. I'm not against that. And that's great when that comes along, but more like it's always played with questions, wonderings, imagines. What if this happened? You know, what if this juxtaposition was happening with between these two people, between these two forms? Um, what about some resolves of certain marital conflicts or relationship conflicts? It's more of the issues of questions that we are playing with. And I have found the ability of music, but also art, visual arts, in being able to express those things in tangible form. And I want to, I want to emphasize the intangible being expressed tangibly. Um, it's a hopeless quest, but you may hit upon it, you may touch upon it at many times, but it's worth doing. And when you look at the artwork on the walls, mine as well as my wife's, it's, you'll find some, you know, a lot of things defined, um, explained visually um, as one could see them in the real world, but also I want the works to entertain how you would see um, the lines, the marks, the spaces, the designs. What kind of images does it, you know, conjure up inside you? Um, or what kind of questions visually, spe you know, visually speaking um, does it raise inside you and to wrestle with those? Enjoy the works for how they communicate to you, not how you're told to interpret something or how you feel you should try to look at something. Maybe something brand new is um, something that, uh, you know, a new way of seeing things that maybe you enjoy, but maybe you're not, you're kind of reluctant to bring and tell to others. Experience that. Um, and also from um, inspirations from all the great works um, of artwork in many cultures to ancient works like the, the cave drawings of Lasso and Dardanelle in France to that of a spirited dynamic drawing of a child, of a young person um, who maybe does not have a handle on the verbal language but expresses things visually with an incredible poignancy. Um, I'm continually amazed by how the visual language through work, through drawing especially, of all the visual arts, the drawing arts, are the most immediate and intimate, how they express the connections between two different worlds. And to make a note of that, these two worlds being how it expresses that person's connection with the outside world, what it looks like, what it is, with the inner world that is themselves, the internal, the infinite world that all of us are as human beings in terms of our imaginations, the limits of our intelligence and beyond, our wonderings, our questions. It's an, it's a, you know, it's, it's an eternal vast um, or vessel that needs expression. And I found artworks to be the most satisfying and immediate way of expressing that sort of intangible relationship between what's inside me, what's inside one, an individual with 
the world that we all live in that can be seen in a myriad of different ways. Um, another way of saying it, it's looking at, um, it's a way of making a fresh daily existence, banal um, forms and spaces that we walk through bombard us every day and seeing them with fresh new eyes, seeing the extraordinariness in ordinary things. Um, you look at anything for any extended period of time in a meditative spirit, um, it's almost meditative. It's like deeply spiritual. It's almost like an act of prayer. And all of a sudden, you're seeing something made a little bit different, less encumbered by definitions that are thrown at one as one should look at it, but looking at it for what it is on its own terms. Um, there again, seeing it maybe as metaphor as well as a literal type of form. Um, and then um, seeing... Um, Thus, in terms of many of my drawings up on the second floor, this is kind of a unique ex exhibition of work for me. I've always showcased um, um, involved prints, larger works, perhaps in painting, but mainly in prints, book artworks, but I have never showcased specifically the ongoing thread of all the work, which is the intimate um, um, works of the drawing arts, something I do every single day. Um, and you can, drawing is the most powerful art form, I think, because it's, it, it's immediacy to human thought. You can do it in any medium, on any material, in any situation, and there's no excuse not to do it. And basically, it's, um, and through in kind of continued investigation into the drawing media, um, issues of um, light and dark, um, in and out, um, visual issues of um, intangibility of form versus tangibility of form, things defined, not defined. Um, and that becomes a kind of like part of the reality is you look at something, it's never fixed. It's never a static thing. Um, you realize the world, the nature of forms that seem very stable and static, are actually it's very fluid depending upon how other people look at it, how you look at it from different vantage points in space. Um, it becomes a different way of seeing that one thing. Um, and such forms, the more being have, I've done them thousands and thousands of times for over decades, they become a different kind of language that becomes metaphorical to other forms that are that have a way of expressing those issues inside one's thinking. Um, different vast ranges of experience from joy to utter depression. Um, another way that I would like people to, um, when I do artwork, is just the media itself. Language of line and shape and color and space become on reality in themselves. They can create their own statements, which invites the viewer to look in and to engage in and to have that expression throw back onto the viewer. What are you about? Where are you? So, anyway, my other influences artistically are um, some key artists that I would encourage the students here and anybody to look up. Giorgio Morandi, in terms of just the beauty and the timelessness of simple spaces and forms. Alberto Giacometti, um, tantamount sculptor and grassman of the 20th century in Western cultures in terms of just the process that is evident in a drawing being created and destroyed. Um, um, a drawing is not a fixed thing. It's a living thing, like a human being. You can't define it one way or the other, but it exists. Um, Rembrandt, incredible vision of a master of our field. Um, three to 400 years ago in terms of just the internal, the internal world of the human psyche amongst the most humble surroundings. Edward Hopper, fantastic American painter that illuminated the American landscape from its banal, ordinary existence into an iconic type of form, set of forms, um, separate from that of Europe. Paul Clay, the incredible um, inventor and uh, um, creator of abstract worlds, the inventor of the abstract language in art in terms of color, form, line, and shape, in terms of evocative of, again, the intangibles of so much of human experience. Anyway, that's about all that I have at this point. I would just like people to get to enjoy the works as they are. Feel free to ask questions to either of us in terms of um, how the works come to you, questions about media. You have to see prints and all kinds of things, but it comes from the uh, love of drawing that simplest of art forms, which is a universal language. Now, I hand it over to my wife, Anna. I was thinking about what I could 
say that would be of value to you all and i guess i mostly wanted to talk to those of you who are thinking about pursuing a life in the arts and what is it that has kept me doing art for all these years and um so i i started thinking about um and and it's not just if you're thinking about that but to any of you who who want to make more space perhaps in your life for art or who have thought about wanting to bring more art into your life um and i and i so i wanted to think about what it is that has caused me to do that over the span of my life and i thought about um you know it does start out when you're a child and and the things that influenced you and i spent a lot of time just um i grew up in rural iowa kind of not a lot going on my siblings had mostly all grown up and moved out and my parents were kind of old and tired after raising eight children and they let me pretty much go my own way and do my own thing and and i spent a lot of time just kind of um i guess daydreaming and just allowing myself to go out and absorb the world and um that became a very formative experience for me and I, as i grew older i started to realize that it didn't seem like the adults that i knew were having as much fun as i was and i didn't really want that to happen to me so i i wanted to um i thought about how can i keep that from happening and i i kind of decided pretty early on that this space i, I decided that the reason they didn't seem like they were having so much fun is because they were too busy and too tired and i wanted to um kind of make sure that i could create that keep some of that space in my life as i grew older and i i think looking back that's been kind of the main challenge of my life because that space is really where art comes from and where creativity comes from and i think it's also where joy comes from um so as I as I grew started growing older, um, of course I did become more busy like we all do, and um, I found a lot of inspiration in um, find that that space became becomes as we get older it does become harder to find because we are busy, um, and so some of the things that helped me to um, hold on to some of that were um, the things that were, were inspiring to me. Um, stories were always um, very much of an inspiration, especially stories about things that happened in different times or places than the time and place where I was. Um, fantasy or science fiction or even historical fiction. Um, some of my favorites, of course, the C.S. Lewis books and Tolkien books. Um, also poetry, especially the poetry that can kind of bring you to a different plane of existence or make you see things differently or experience the world differently. Um, theology also offers, you know, brings you, kind of just helps you to see things in a different way. That's always been a source of inspiration. And then of course, art and music. Um, especially i've always been drawn to the art of early humans um like the early cave paintings or um, the little goddess sculptures that are probably the earliest known art that we've ever found um and if you look closely i see bill looking straight at that piece right there as i say that <laughs> you can see that those some of those pieces have found their way into my work um also animals, I've always been fascinated by what, what is, how do animals experience life? What is it like to be an animal? And just different viewpoints have always been um, so sources of inspiration. Um, I did go to Augustana, as Bill mentioned, and I had uh, wonderful, teachers there, I learned um, hone my skills of 
drawing and seeing and looking and learned a lot about art history and the different ways that artists have kind of different philosophies of expression and all sorts of things that have all added to my, I guess, broadened and deepened my ways of looking at my own work and expressing it. And one of the things that we were told at Augustana, probably the most frequently heard thing that we were told at Augustana, and probably that you guys have been told by your teachers too, is that, you know, don't count on earning your living as an artist. You probably won't. It's very, very difficult. And they were just adamant that that's not a reason to let go of it. It's the most important thing in your life. Or maybe it's hand in hand with the most important things in your life. And don't lose it. And no matter what you have to do to earn your daily bread and butter, make sure you save the best part of your energy and the best part of yourself for your artwork. And that is something that we've had varying levels of success with over the years, but we always keep coming back to it. And of course, what they don't tell you is that, you know, they used to say, our drawing professor is famous for saying, yeah, I used to work in a gas station and I wouldn't, I'd sleep every other night and I would just, you know, I would do my artwork all the time if I wasn't working. And, you know, what they don't tell you is that you have to have three jobs if you're going to, it's hard to find the time and you guys know this and some of you will learn it. But that space that I learned to try to create when I was young that has kind of kept me going, that's, it's hard to find, but it's so important. And even if, you know, maybe you're not a visual artist, maybe you're a musician, or maybe you just are, maybe you appreciate art or love to look at it or listen to music or read stories, that space is like, it's where our humanity is the closest to us, I think. And I wanted to say something too just about how work becomes, you know, the work of survival becomes really even such a temptation because, you know, we all learn at some point that the harder we work, the more things we can get, the more money, the more recognition, the more whatever it is, and it almost becomes like a greed thing where we just get so like, if I just work harder, I can have this and this and this, and people will respect me, and I can, you know, whatever, and we may not even admit it to ourselves, but that temptation is always there. But after a while, the rewards that you get from hard work, you begin to realize that those rewards aren't really worth it. They're not satisfying enough to make all that work worth it. And so you kind of come back to um, looking again for that, that space. And I don't have a really good word for um, what to call that space, but it's not the same thing as just not doing anything. It's, it's related to that, but it's, 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 it's the will, it's, it's not doing anything, but then it's also just opening yourself and listening and looking, and it's kind of just a way of letting the world seep in, and you all know what I'm talking about. You've all experienced it, and you're, you probably all have your own way of seeking this out and, and living it in your lives, but I guess what I wanted to tell you is that that's the source for me of being an artist, and of, because that's the place where art comes in and where creativity comes in. Um, so what I just wanted, I guess, to really say is that to me the first and the most basic requirement of being an artist is 
it's not just about skill or talent it's about creating that space and finding that space where you can allow yourself to just be in the world and observe and listen and let it come to you creating that space kind of like when you want to grow a garden you have to remove the weeds and the grass and and then you can begin to grow things the work that I make is it's not intended to express a specific thing or to put forth a particular message it just it's something that just comes out of me and I hope that it will reach that same place in you that it comes out of in me which is a place that's beyond verbal expression I hope that it will give you some moments of curiosity maybe even wonder possibly even joy and maybe it will give you the curiosity or the desire to pick up a pencil and do some sketching of your own and look for that that place in yourself so I'm going to leave you with a quote that one of our professors at Augustana actually two, one from each of them Carl Grupp who was our drawing and printmaking instructor and mentor to both of us um, used to tell us all the time times just like I have as a quote from Delacroix and it is oh young artist you search for a subject the subject is yourself in the presence of nature and then the other one is Bob Aldern um, who was our painting professor and mentor and he used to tell us all the time that if you are an artist you will have a happy life and I think that's really true so thank you all for coming and we'll open it up for questions now if anyone has questions for either of us. Many of you maybe have not seen a lot of the show yet, and we understand that, but you know, you're welcome to talk to us individually. We'll be here for a while, of course. Um, the show's up through the end of March, so, and uh, it's a great long showing, which we're really thankful to have. Um, and so we're open to, you know, any kind of inquiry that you from you to us, and I mean um, specifically, you know, even discussed or the quandaries or frustrations at looking at a piece, express that openly as well. Um, and uh, another story that comes to mind is Anna's. <laughs> There's another story that I do want to mention from one of our mentors that Anna has already mentioned, from Carl Grubb. In fact, I would even encourage people to look into Carl Grubb's. He's passed away just this last spring, um, age 80, um, but an incredible printmaker, craftsman, painter. Look into websites of his work online. Um, he always gave a story to us in basic drawing. Age 19, age 18, when we first took our first serious college art classes. And it was a tale um, that stemmed from the time of Rembrandt, where there's the the time when Rembrandt was sort of like walking down the street, you know, he had between studios or whatever experiences in downtown Amsterdam, and up comes this young, this young merchant who, um, you know, Rembrandt was quite famous at the time, you know, in Amsterdam, and a lot of people knew who knew about the master that he was often um, referred to as, and. Uh, and one of these things, merchant comes up to him and says, you know, I got this fantastic brand new art pen made out of gold, beautiful silk ink from the East Indies, and uh, this magical papyrus paper, you know, just, to, it, you know, I lost, you know, I used all my paychecks and all my funds for my sales just to buy this, and, uh, and I just wanted to show you this drawing that I had done um, from, um, you know, just from observation, and just wanted to show you to get your feedback, um, Master, what do you think? And uh, in Rembrandt, likewise, it was kind of a sort of like a slimy, rainy day. He picks his finger up into the gutter, pulls it up full of mud, and takes a little piece of papyrus or just trash piece of old wrapping paper, crepe paper from maybe from an old painting that he had just unwrapped, and just did a couple little marks on the paper of something that he was seeing while they were in conversation of some people down the street. And the tale is, is that 
even though the merchant had a drawing and the most splendid art materials that the world could buy. Um, the art materials were fantastic. The drawing was schmuck. Rembrandt's drawing was golden, but the materials were schmuck. So again, if you're serious about creating anything, whether it's music, composition, there's no place, no excuse not to do it. You can do it anywhere. You need to create that space. Thank you. Questions? It's caused um, marital strife. Um, uh, the thing is that we were doing that long before we ever got together. And I think in a way, one of the reasons we got together is because we were each the other's best, like, you know, we help each other do better work, I guess. And it was awesome. Um, I feel very lucky that you know, my wife, and I don't think she feels the same about me, um, we're authoritative, informed critics. We will not stop. If we're not going to say anything sugar-coated. It's going to be honest right from the gut. It eats S-U-C-K-S, -S, you know, or in why. And you need to do this and this, and without risk of, you know, the other one just moving out. No, not at all. <laughs> um, but again, we were well into the field long before we yeah. knew each other. Not. You may lose a night sleep over it and continue the dialogue the next morning, but yeah. uh, I'll comment on that later. Um, <laughs> it's been kind of an enriching thing. I think when you're in an artistic or creative field, you have unique sensibilities or particular sensibilities which are. Um, you know, you, you see things in different ways, and to find somebody else, you know, a compatible kindred spirit, it's kind of magical, and we're, we're very lucky. Any other questions? Yes. Joe. and boxes just full of stuff that I've, little sketches or little experiments that I've done. And then I, I like to combine things and you'll see that when you look at my stuff, there's just, it's, I mean, even, like I think that one and this one have pieces from the same drawing that I cut up that actually I think was in a different show and I cut it up and turned it into some different pieces for this show. And I call it my candy jar. And that's an excellent question in terms of how to work in the arts. Um, you know, I always thought of it, you know, a great artist or a painter or a sculptor it works on one project only until it's, you know, finished from beginning to end. Um, nothing could be more opposite of that in the truth of how artists um, really do work, and I think maybe should work. Um, you do mul I do multiple things, multiple drawings. I have like two or three prints, um, a full journal of drawings and sketches ongoing. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, um, many drawings hit the scrap heap or they develop, you know, what I call the, the trash folio. And, uh, and you look at that stuff maybe months later and pull some things out and a drawing or a mark hits you in a certain way, you use it and you utilize it in a different piece. So it's a continual act of not just creating but destroying what may be sacred to you and then getting it re a rebirth. Um, that's hard to do when you spent hours on something, perfecting something, getting the, just the right effect, and then realizing, you know, it's just not doing anything. The best thing I would suggest is that you just need to destroy the entire piece. Erase it entirely, rip it up, redraw over it, and through that act of, so to speak, failure, something beautiful and maybe surprising will happen, and that is the thing to pay attention to. Something comes back at you that you never could have predicted. 
And it's like going through death to come back to life. I mean, easier said than done. <laughs> but, anyway. but thank you. Excellent question. stop when you have a frame around it and glass over it and there's <laughs> nothing else you can do to change it anymore. Is that anything you have for <laughs> That may be the toughest thing to do in um, creating works is when to finish a piece. When is it done? Um, A lot of it, um, for me, uh, in terms of when a piece is done or how do you finish a piece up, um, after spending a lot of work on something, I pay attention to the fact, um, when I look at it, I give it some time where I'm not working on it at all, like maybe weeks, several weeks, maybe a month, you know, several, several days, and just do other things, even non-art related. Um, maybe practice the trombone a little bit, you know, play a little bit of music, and, or, or read books, or, you know, read uh, the newspaper, you know, just, or go out for coffee, go out for beer, you know, whatever. Do not look at the work, do not become involved in it for a sustained period of time, then come back at it. And if the work comes back to me in a way that I would never have imagined, or there's a surprise element or a spark, that tells me that that piece is on its way out in terms of maybe being somewhat resolved. When I look back at it again, it's just like, oh, well, that's kind of cool, but it's like, I've seen this before. Um, it comes back to you like a brand new idea or something totally unpredictable, even if it's horrific or undesirable, but there's an energy to it. And I would say another thing to keep in mind when you're doing work, any of you developing portfolios, getting stuff for different show, pay attention to the element of time over months and years after you finish a piece. It may not be done until you're 27, 28. You've lived that long, you've gone through experiences Frustrating, grand, glorious, joyful, depressing, whatever, in and out of life experience will affect you how you look at things. And then maybe those marks that you had no idea, knowing what you were doing at the time, making them have a resonating effect. Seriously, that's something to pay attention to. Great question. Um, Bookmaking, um, something that I've kind of most recently done with my work as a printmaker primarily. Um, printmaking is just what I call incredible, um, incredible extensions of the arts of the arts of drawing onto different matrices, different services. And uh, printmaking, because of its ability to make multiples, and uh, you can also work with it concerning um, transferences of digital imagery and text. Um, it's something that I've recently over the last six or seven years I've looked into in terms of just combining printmaking images with that of um, um, text, working with poets, writers. And um, it just becomes a way of working with an image over several series of pages, over um, um, like stills in a cartoon, stills in a video. Um, it's like a multiple faceted, um, continually changing drawing that, is, that takes place over several pages several different segments. Um, so I've, I've not made a ton of books at all, but I've, I've had some incredible experiences in combining with an incredible poet in our area, John Olsa, and uh, in terms of some of his incredible poetry, um, creating images in, that are inspired by a literary term or literary word or poetic form. That is something that's not usual to my experience in terms of where images come from. I mainly perceptually um, inspired artists in terms of what I look at, but when it comes to images inspired by literary concepts, ideas, poetic, that opened up a whole new realm of things. So I'm working on um, some ideas for some books in terms of broadsides. Um, 
dealing with an extended lot of long landscape such as the print that is behind bill the lower one is a part of a national landscape portfolio that i was invited to be a part of of printmakers from across the country on the extended landscape um but it just becomes a different way of looking at images and text together as an art form and i'm something i'm wanting to get further into because of its collaborative possibilities with other artists other poets other writers you know in other art forms and it's easy to 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 generate mock-ups and ideas for books That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> it's much harder to title a piece than it is your own child, um, <laughs> in terms of the name. <laughs> I will tell you for myself, it, it kind of is, as I'm working on a piece, I start to develop certain associations with it, and I don't start out working with those associations, but as I, as I begin to as the piece begins to kind of complete itself and I feel like it's coming together, it starts to suggest certain images or ideas, a certain, like you said, it is nonverbal, so you can tell we both have a hard time putting words to it, but usually there's just kind of a word that, or something that it makes me think of that kind of just comes into my head. So that's fine. With me, um, I try to make the titles maybe in terms of grammatically or verbally, as simple as possible, in terms of just the very bare elements that are maybe a part of some of the imagery. Um, you know, just um, form, solid, wall, stage, um, landscape, a certain kind of space. Um, I try to make the titles minimally descriptive, but maybe hitting on the essence of maybe a relationship between forms. You know, um, or, the idea of juxtaposition is a great term. You put two very different things together, they don't cancel each other out. It's not like Democrat and Republican, you know, but they, they can embellish each other into a brand new idea. You know, um, usually the works, as, as Anne was saying, after they kind of come together, they, you know, or a work really kind of, kind of comes home, it really starts um, su suggesting something. The title will come from the work itself towards the end of its evolvement. Versus, you know, thinking of it ahead of time and then doing the piece. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Mainly just a couple of clues in a title, not to uh, get the audience or the viewer to think that they had to think about something differently, but just to kind of give them a couple of clues. That's it. not give away very much in my titles. I want the viewer to come up with their own story about what it's about, but I want to give them just enough to draw them in and make them start thinking or imagining their own story with it. Any other questions? like I decide I feel like I just it's it's really just what I happen to have a yen to work pick up and work with or what's available and a lot of our work is really small just because our house is really small 
and our budget is really small, and so we just <laughs> do small pieces, and that's okay with me. I, I, I don't, um, I don't have a big desire to work with things that hurt my hands or things that cost a lot of money or, you know, I, I like to just work with whatever's available and easy to work with and fun. For myself, um, I always have, as long as I can remember, I love the drawing arts, um, the most basic being that pencil or the pen, you know. Um, what is maybe the media that's most available at any time? And um, I love the act of mark making. It's almost like a sculptor hacking on a surface and, you know, sculpting a surface or, you know, um, maybe it's a prisoner making hash marks on a wall and waiting until he gets liberated or whatever. But I feel the need to interact. No. No, you're thinking about that in the wrong way. But um, I just feel the need to be physically involved with the work by assembling, you know, lines and marks, and then the form kind of comes of itself. Um, um, a lot of times I would suggest, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great to change media because you think visually in a different way with different media. Um, maybe, you know, certain medias are not available. We'll try something that you had no experience at, and you'd be surprised what may come about. Um, I've always loved just the act of the slow building of marks into images that is drawing, and therefore I... Now, printmaking is another way of extending that. Best of all, you're making and carving physically, um, altering a surface in the printmaking media to create a drawing image. And it's that physical interaction, highest resistance, painful, you know, just dogged, that is absolutely inspiring to me. One of the assignments that I had for printmaking students that when I taught a basic printmaking class, um, they had to do an Italian image, which is basically etching and drawing marks on a copper plate. It's physically um, tough to do, you know, but there's ways of working through grounds and etching it. And then once they get a highly developed image and did uh, maybe a small addition of two or three prints, um, they had to scrape the entire image off the plate to the pack to the point where the plate had nothing on it at all, totally effaced, and then let that ghost image, or those resi residual marks, be the, the inauguration of the second image. And, uh, but they had to erase the entire thing, scraping it. And that's physically very tough. Um, cut fingers, they need it. Just the act of it, erasing and subtracting things can be a very creative act. This has been a pleasure. Thank you all for coming, and just enjoy the show and reception.